recording and recording and Hello, and welcome to We'll Tell You What We're Reading from the Waltham Public Library, our monthly YouTube show in which we tell you what we're reading. Aren't we clever with the names? Um, my name I'm the head reference librarian at the Waltham Public Library. I am joined by my colleagues, Louise Goldstein, our um, outreach librarian, Liz Rior, our collection development specialist, and Greg Carter, our, like to say, not an official title, but I call him our science fiction fantasy specialist. I hope you don't mind. I just made up a title for you, Greg, but kind of fits. Um, as always, we will be discussing and we'll also have some fun where we talk about some TV shows. Unfortunately, The Book of Boba Fett is ended. That I don't know if we'll be able to surpass that, um, that discussion. That was probably one of the more fun discussions we've had about shows. Um, maybe someone on here has watched The Gilded Age. I have feelings about that show. So that could be fun. Maybe not as fun as Boba Fett. Um, we... Um, just so you know, we do also have regular book clubs at the library. This Saturday, we actually are having an in-person book club, first time since 2020. Um, we'll be discussing Station Eleven. Maybe not everybody wants to read that right now. I get it. But if you do, it's actually a beautiful book. Awesome. Um, lovely written. It actually is a show right now on HBO Max. That is meeting in our trustees room at 10 a.m. on Saturday, March 12th. Um, and then Greg is online, going to be leading discussion on March 14th um, for the Science Fiction Book Club. And then Louise is leading an online discussion, two of them, on March 23rd and um, March 28th. Um, the first is, um, Louise, I'll have you say them because I'm forgetting how to tell my head. <laughs> so on um, March 23rd, Wednesday, it's a tale for the time being by Ruth Ozeki. And on March 28th, uh, which is a Monday, it is Being Human, H-E-U-M-A-N-N, -N, by Judith Human. Thank you, Louise, and thank you for saving me when I forgot my line. Um, this is not live technically, but we recorded live, um, so always still fun room for mistakes and bloopers. Um, you can see information about all of our book clubs, including Zoom links to anything virtual. Um, on our website, we also do a virtual, which is going to stay virtual even after um, we bring back in-person book clubs. Um, tell us what you're reading. That's usually the first Monday of the month at night online, um, where basically similar to this format, except patrons get to join us as, as well. Um, Greg and I actually um, led the discussion this past um, Monday, and on our next one is Monday, April 4th, and I'll be leading, co-leading that discussion with Amber, who also sometimes joins us on the show, and who will be leading the discussion this Saturday. So without further ado, um, we are going to tell you what we're reading, um, and my um, first up is Greg, and I will give him the floor. Thank you so much, Laura. All right, so um, I was only able to read two books in the past month. Um, so one of them is a uh, book group, my book group. Uh, so yes, I'm advertising. So uh, let's have that at it. All right. And we're gonna play from the start. Here we go. So um, the first book group um, that, uh, no, I'm sorry, the first book that uh, I'm going to bring up is um, Hyperion by Dan Simmons. It's a science fiction book, and it's the uh, book that we're going to be talking about next week. Um, so I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but I'm going to give you a premise and um, what I thought about it um, a little bit. So suffice to say, Hyperion is a um, book that takes place in um, roughly like 800 years after humanity has left Earth and pretty much discovered, um, you know, space travel and all of that uh, good stuff. And it's pretty much created like kind of a galactic empire. Um, unfortunately, though, like today, humanity isn't exactly... Um, you know, agreeing on, you know, agreeing to disagree or, you know, talk to each other about things, but um, kind of enduring like an intergalactic war, uh, one that might very well tear apart everything. So while all of this is happening, um, a pilgrimage is occurring to this planet called Hyperion. And what makes Hyperion kind of unique is that it is a planet that is not held by either side of this conflict. It is kind of its own, in, uh, independent uh, 
like realm. And the reason for that is, is that there is this creature or being called the Shrike there. And the Shrike, to put it bluntly, is a godlike being of murderous rage. It anybody who comes across it usually doesn't end in a good place. Usually they end in several places. Um, and uh, it's so it's not something you you ever really want to meet. However, the weird thing is, is that there is this church around it and you can go on a pilgrimage to its planet. And if seven people go on this pilgrimage, one person out of this pilgrimage will get a pretty much like a wish granted of nearly anything they want. Uh, the other six will die horribly. Um, so there are these um, seven pilgrims who are going on this, uh, you know, trip to Hyperion on the eve of what might be Galactic Armageddon. And while they're doing this, um, each person, you know, it gets brought up like, why would somebody go on a trip like this? I mean, when you have like, oh, like only a one out of seven chance of actually getting what you want. And then the other chances are like stacked against you to die a messy death. So the story kind of takes place in like a Canterbury Tales type of way where each pilgrim tells their story, what brought them there. Um, each of them have a different reason. Some people want to, you know, there's some people who are doing it because they are like, foolishly optimistic other people do it out of sheer desperation some people are doing it because they are under the belief that they can actually kill this thing um but regardless of their thoughts the shrike waits for them all at this planet um i have to say that um so this book won uh the hugo award in during when it first came out um and while i would not say it's a perfect book and um by any stretch of the imagination, it is an incredibly good book. I really liked it. Um, if you like the Canterbury Tales in space or classical references or anything like that, I would say give it a try. It is a long book, I want to warn you. And um, Dan Simmons loves, loves his classic, um, his literary references. So I remember I was like having to go back to my college textbooks and looking a few things up. But if you're willing to do that and just like in in I don't think those like element you don't have to know every classical reference I think it is just kind of like if you are just allowing it to go and experience this like new strange kind of world that I have not seen in a lot of science fiction I would say give it a read I think it's really enjoyable it's really cool um and uh I'm really happy I read it and uh, if you want to talk more about it uh come join me next week on at uh Monday night at seven o'clock. Um, all right, so next book. Um, I decided I was going to go to the references uh, to the old stuff as well um, and uh, decided to read one of, revisit one of my favorite Shakespearean um, plays, uh, the Scottish play or for us non-actors, uh, Macbeth. Um, it is a very, I mean, I feel like I'm, there's, what's been said about that has already, about this book has already been said, but on the other hand, um, you know, I have to give a synopsis of some degree here, um, but suffice to say, it focuses on the um, Scottish Lord Macbeth, and Macbeth is coming back from a battle, from a battle which he has won for his king, uh, Duncan, and while he and his friends are on their way to, you know, celebrate their victory, um, they encounter a trio of witches and these witches are like, hey, congratulations, you're going to be a lord, you know, of this impressive uh, region because of what you've done. And he's like, really? Wow, uh, that's cool. Nobody's told me that. And he's like, and one of them goes, oh yeah, you're also gonna be king. And you know, Macbeth is humoring them and all that. And then lo and behold, what the witches said are, um, comes true. And so he's like, well, if that came true, maybe be, me being king comes true. And his wife, uh, the infamous Lady Macbeth is like, well, if you want that to come true, you have to act upon it and suggests that he conspire to commit regicide. And after that, it all just goes down the, downhill from there. It is an incredibly dark, incredibly brooding, incredibly fascinating look at like the uh, nastier aspects of human nature. Um, you might not be into that. Uh, 
I kind of am in this novel. Uh, also, it's got some supernatural witches and stuff like that, so you can't go wrong. Um, if you would, um, it's also made like a bunch of great inspirations for um, like uh, adaptations. Uh, my three favorite are actually probably Joel Edgert, um, no, um, one of the Coen brothers like renditions of Macbeth, which is done by Francis McDormand and uh, Denzel Washington. That's really cool. Um, also the uh, version called Scotland PA where um, it takes place in this random Pennsylvania town and instead of a kingdom it's a fast food uh, joint and uh, Christopher Walken is, is uh, the character of Macduff. Uh, that is a great one. Definitely watch that if you can. Um, it's just a it's just a weird classic. Um, and uh, yeah, so give it a watch. Just make sure that if you ever act it out, don't say the name because evidently that's really bad luck. Um, you know, you can say it here because we're not acting, uh, but you know, beware the Scottish play. Anyway, that's all I've got. Thank you so much. Louise, oh, I believe man. you're up. I'm so sorry, Louise, my bad. <laughs> that is absolutely fine. Great, uh, thank you for sharing. Yeah, maybe I should reread Macbeth, it's been a while. Um, okay, I wanted to share with you this book, uh, Cutting for Stone. I believe it came out in the early 2000s by Abraham Verghese. I apologize Verghese. to Abraham. Sorry. Thank Verghese. you, thank you. Abraham Verghese. Um, apologies, uh, Abraham, because I love your book and I would love to pronounce your name correctly. <laughs> Um, this is a really, 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 really good novel. Um, it's a little bit long, um, but I personally could not put it down. Um, it has an amazing plot. The characters are very well developed. The scenery, uh, the, the locations are really interesting because it's taking place um, in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. And um, we're starting out in the 50s, 1950s, and we go up to, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe the 60s, 70s. I actually, um, at least 20 years, so at least to the 70s. Um, and it, it's a, a wonderful story. We start out with a, a nun, Sister Mary Joseph Praise, who's coming from India. She's heading to Africa. To, with another nun to do some ministering as nuns often did or do. Um, and, but the ship that they take is not good for people. And a lot of people start getting sick on this ship. Uh, and the nun whose sister Mary Joseph Praise is with gets very ill. And there's a doctor on the ship, um, Dr. Stone and, uh, Notice it's called Cutting for Stone and the doctor is named Dr. Stone, um, but um, that's on purpose. But the, the doctor gets saved, but the other nun doesn't. Um, and after a while, Sister Mary Joseph Praise ends up working in the same hospital in Africa as Dr. Stone. Thomas Stone is his full name and he's a surgeon and she ends up being a valued partner to the surgeon and the hospital is run by a matron. And um, basically the, the big premise of the book is that Sister Mary Joseph prays, it turns out is pregnant. We are not sure who the father is, although we can guess. Um, and she gives birth to two twins who are uh, conjoined at the head um, she does not survive the birth. And basically the novel is uh, narrated by one of the twins whose name is Marion, who was named after a famous surgeon. And his twin's name is Shiva, who's named after the Lord Shiva. Dr. Thomas Stone takes off after these twins are born. He disappears. We don't know where he goes. And one of the doctors, Hem, Hema, Hema, and another doctor named Ghosh end up falling in love and raising these twins. 
um, both of the twins end up becoming doctors. And uh, we're going through Marion's journey and his loves and getting a job, he has to flee to America. And it, it's such a wonderful book. I, I can't tell you, there's a lot of medical detail in this book. I just need to say, you know, a lot of very detailed descriptions of surgery and of bodies and being a doctor. I personally found it very interesting and illuminating. And also, um, I think the author's a little bit philosophical about doctoring and what doctoring means. And um, also about uh, missionary work and what that means and what, what can heal people and about the human touch, the human touch and about being human, a nun uh, becoming pregnant, which of course nuns are not supposed to become pregnant, but she's human and something happens and we find out all as the book develops, the characters are so well drawn. I can't say enough about this book. Cutting for Stone is actually a reference to the Hippocratic Oath. Um, it's not good to cut for stone when it's not necessary. In other words, it's not good to perform unnecessary surgeries. I guess back in the day, people would have uh, stones like in their bladder and there were people who were like stone cutters. I mean, this is way back, maybe in the time of Socrates and they would cut out the stones and, and uh, they would just keep using the knife because they didn't sterilize the knives in those days. And so people would die from having the stones cut out and uh, not a good practice, basically. Um, this is a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, some people have compared it to 19th century novels because of, of the richness of the characters and of the story. And I can, I can see that. Um, fabulous. Did I tell you I liked it? <laughs> All right. This next one is going to be for the book group for um, the Monday uh, March 28th book group, the Initiating Inspiration book group. I have read some other books, but I'm choosing to share this book, not only as a prequel to the book group, but because it's such a good book. Um, it just so happens that March is Disability Awareness Month too. So this is a good time to talk about this book. Um, wow, Judith Human is an amazing, amazing person. She, she was born um, I believe in the 40s, and she had polio as a child, and she is quadriplegic, and she grew up in Brooklyn. And when she was growing up, um, they didn't have electric wheelchairs. Uh, a lot of places did not have adaptive anything, adaptive technology. Kids didn't necessarily go to public schools when they had handicaps, uh, or I shouldn't say handicaps, disabilities. Um, uh, people with disabilities were kind of isolated. Uh, she says in her childhood, the time when she felt the best was when she went to summer camp because she would go with other kids who had various disabilities, you know, physical disabilities. Um, maybe they were deaf, you know, blind, uh, maybe like herself needed a wheelchair to get around and they felt like they could really be themselves, you know, during these times. And so, Later in her life, she became an activist and she fought very hard for um, Section 504 of, uh, you know, she, she's coming after the civil rights movement, but in the 1960s, but in the civil rights movement, there really wasn't anything for people with disabilities at that time. And, you know, I think, I think it's a little hard for some of us to imagine to not have ramps, to not have accessible buses to not have accessible trains, buildings, you know, a lot of the things we take for granted now, they didn't have back then. And so um, they fought very hard to get Section 504, part of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, because disabled people were left out of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, you know, before 504 gets passed, it was legal to discriminate against someone with a disability. Businesses, schools did not have to accommodate disabled employees or customers. Um, Section 504 said no otherwise qualified handicapped individual in the US as defined in section seven shall solely by reason of his, they even said his, they didn't say his or her, his handicap 
be excluded from the participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity uh, receiving federal financial assistance. So they, they fought very hard to get this bill passed, but it still needed a signature from the Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare. So because it hadn't gotten the signature, there were protests in Washington, DC, Boston, Seattle, New York, Atlanta, Philadelphia, Chicago, Dallas, Denver. Uh, but the San Francisco protest was the only one that held out. And that's where Judith Human was. And she was one of the leaders. And it was a 26 day protest. And um, they needed to get to Jodis, I'm sorry, Joseph Califano and President Carter to get this, uh, this passed. And they actually did get it passed. And this paved the way for the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. And uh, apparently the Trump administration made some efforts to weaken the power of the ADA. Um, and so, uh, we always have to be aware of, of people's rights. And, and she's just such an amazing, strong person. And she's married and she's super educated and she worked uh, with Hillary Clinton uh, at one time. And um, she's amazing. So really good book. I, I couldn't put it down. I, I have a tiny, tiny bit left to read, but it's, it's a really gripping book. Uh, the description of her childhood in Brooklyn is, is so beautifully written too. I love this book. And last, I want to talk about this book called A Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Ozeki. Um, this is, I'm reading this book now, again, for a book club. This is my second Ruth Ozeki novel. And I had read her, her book, The Book of Form and Emptiness, which I absolutely loved. And this book also, I just wanted to talk about it because it's it's a wonderful book. It has a bit of, uh, I guess I'm going to call it magical realism in it. There are some things happening that are a little bit mystical, um, which I enjoy in this book. Um, and a uh, very interesting setting. Uh, the book is taking place mostly in tiny bit in Manhattan, but mostly in British Columbia on this very small, very sparsely inhabited island and in Japan. And it's being told to us through two main characters. One is a writer named Ruth and one is a young girl in Japan named Nao, N-A-O Nao. And, um, Interestingly, Ruth finds a Hello Kitty lunchbox that washes up on the shores in her island in British Columbia that has a diary that was kept by now, and the diary is pretty much intact, uh, and she learns about now's life, and her, Ruth lives in this, in this uh, house on this island with her husband Oliver and um, their cat. And um, it seems that the Japanese tsunami and earthquake of 2011 is probably part of why this, this Hello Kitty lunchbox made it all the way through the Pacific, all the way to where Ruth lives. And she's getting so absorbed in the diary of now and learning about now's uh, great grandmother, Jiko who um, now gets to meet, now is having a very difficult childhood. She used to live in California with her parents and her father was a very successful computer programmer in Silicon Valley, but he lost his job and they returned to Japan and they have like no money. Her father can't seem to find a job and they're just living in this little tiny apartment. She's sleeping on a futon in the same bedroom as her parents who have each have a futon. So it's, it's, it's a real come down from how she grew up and she's getting bullied in school. She's even getting scars from all the bullying going on. Um, and the one comfort is when she comes to spend the summer with her great grandmother, Jiko, who is a Zen nun. And um, it's very comforting for her there and sitting Zazen and seeing the wisdom of her grandmother. This is like the one comfort that now gets. And then she goes back Home and her father is suicidal because he can't earn a living. He is, uh, he tries to commit suicide a couple of times. And um, 
there is a lot of hope. I know it sounds awful, but there's a lot of hope in this book. And there, there's a connection that gets made between Ruth on her island in British Columbia and now, and it's amazing. And the book, like I said, it gets kind of mystical, a little bit of magical realism. I feel like it contains like all the elements of what it is to be human and also about war because we learn about um, Jiko's son um, who is, they call him Haruki number one because his name was Haruki and also now father's name was Haruki. And we learn about Haruki number one who um, during World War II had to become one of these suicide kamikaze pilots. And it's all about that miserable experience and about war and, you know, um, but the, the sort of the heroism of, of this son and how he really doesn't like war and how he actually plans to not, um, you know, land on any, anybody. He's gonna land in the ocean so that he doesn't hurt anybody with his suicide mission and um, it's it's a beautiful book and with that I am going to pass this along to my esteemed colleague Laura. Thank you Louise. Uh, both uh, sets a great title so far from you and Greg. Um, thank you for reminding me about um, Scotland TA. I saw that movie in the theater and loved it. Um, such a yet funny, if that's the right word, take on Macbeth, even though it's pretty much Macbeth. I completely forgotten that took place at basically a McDonald's. <laughs> so, um, all right. So um, my first two books um, are basically graphic novels and histories of women's history in honor of March, that is Women's History Month. Um, book is not like that at all something totally different. But to start, um, my first book is She the People, a graphic history of uprisings, breakdowns, setbacks, revolts, and enduring hope on the unfinished road to women's equality. Um, I liked that unfinished is in there uh, by Jen um, Dedrick and illustrated by Rita Sabinor. Um, so this is a combined um, both half graphic, but also a lot written history of the women's movement in the United States, starting with uh, the Declaration of Independence signing in 1776 and culmin culminating through today or rather 2019 when this was published. This was published pretty much, um, I think, to coincide or pre-coinciding because uh, 2020 was the 100th anniversary, but of course of the amendment giving women really more white women, um, the right to vote in this country. Um, the book highlights several women in U.S. history, as well as um, from the beginning, discusses that the women's right movements was neither all inclusive and the historical path for women of color um, was not the same, especially um, black women in this country, as well as um, indigenous women. Um, while white women were ignored um, in the Declaration of Independence, there's line in Hamilton about asking Thomas Jefferson to put women in the sequel. I would love to start singing the Schuyler Sisters to you, but I cannot for fear of copyright violation. Um, American, uh, revolution, and I'm going to quote this book exactly, enslaved women weren't allowed to hold on to their families. They weren't allowed to officially marry. They couldn't hold on to their parents or siblings or often most agonizing their children. Um, very heartbreaking, but also very true. Um, again, as I said, with the um, passing of, um, in 1920, of the amendment giving women the right to vote, that didn't, that wasn't like all of a sudden Shangri-La, yay, all women have the right to vote now. Not so much. Um, there are references to several women um, you most likely have heard of throughout US history, including Frances Perkins um, and Rosa Parks, um, but there may be some new names to you as well, or at least to ignorant me, uh, such as uh, Recy Taylor and Polly Murray. Um, to sort of bring this down a couple of denominators, um, the Peyton Place loving person that I am, I was tickled to see the book's author, Grace Metallius, also gets a shout out. Um, you don't know Peyton Place, uh, maybe I'll talk about that next month. Um, this is a great introduction um, to an all to an inclusive US women's history, um, but it does have its flaws. 
Um, the book jumps from 1776 to 1920 rather quickly, and the majority of the book just covers the last 100 years, or rather 1920-2019. Um, I realized that a lot did happen in that part of the 20th century plus the first 20 years of the 21st century with women's history in this country, but still a lot, there was a lot before 1920. It also would have been nice to get some own voices um, regarding um, some of the parts of women of color. So my next book, and I apologize, um, I realize this book cover looks a little blurry, um, so you probably cannot read the title very well. Um, the next book is Amazon's Abolitionists and Activists, A Graphic History of Women's right, Fight for Their Rights by Mickey Kendall and A. D'Amico. Uh, Mickey Kendall, um, you may, is basically a um, wonderful um, historical um, historian and author, um, Short Hood Feminism, which I highly recommend. Um, this book is complete graphic novel form, unlike the pre its predecessor, and also covers entire world history, not just US history and not just history from the 18th century, late 18th century on. Um, it highlights contribu contributions of women since the start of recorded history, in fact. And it showcases contributions of not just white women, black women, um, native women in this country, um, not just women in Western culture. Um, and also features a lot of women, um, LGBTQ plus women, trans women, um, as well as disability activists, um, such as Louise alluded to. Um, so I said far, the first book did a good job. I think it really being inclusive. This book does a far much more well-rounded. Um, the, there's a framing device in which a women's history professor is talking to her college class, and then she takes them on a literal time traveling trip. So, uh, you know, for our science fiction listeners, you may like that little aspect. And the book mentions all the women mentioned in the previous book, plus more, including Josefa Yanez Escada, Laura Cornelius Kellogg, and Lucy Gonzalez Parsons. Um, the graphic format really lends a lot to making history seem alive. The framing device of the history class sometimes I think gets a little silly at times, truthfully, but I didn't have a major problem with it. And I understand the need to have that to tie everything together, especially since I think the target audience might be the age of the students in that class. Um, highly recommended. And now for something completely different, and I realize I am using a line from a different sketch comedy show, um, put in the comments, you know which one I'm referring to with that. Um, but regardless, um, we are talking about Saturday Night Live. Um, so live from New York, an uncensored history of Saturday Night Live by, and I'm saying by because it's mostly oral history, by Tom Shales and James Andrew Miller is an oral history, as I said, of the long running sketch comedy show Saturday Night Live started in 1975. Um, such show is older than a good number of its cast members at this point. Um, this book has had a few editions, but this one is from 2002. So obviously features nothing about the current cast, some of whom were literal children when this book was published and some of whom may not even, well, yeah, they probably were all born, but were, could have been babies. There are a lot of interviews in this book and some of them may be hard to keep straight. There's so many people in this book, um, but so fun and actually quick read despite the very, um, huge page count. At the time that this book was written, a lot of this was revelatory, um, but for now I'm making to some of you. The biggest um, thing that I found revelatory when I, I, I first read this 20 years ago and I reread it recently because I just rewatched the first five seasons of Saturday Night Live, uh, Chevy Chase uh, having a reputation rather for being a bit of a, well, a word I don't feel comfortable saying on YouTube, but keep in mind when this book came out, I don't know how well known a lot of his antics were. Um, the most interesting part of the book, which is divided into basically segments. Um, so there's like, you know, the beginning, then there's the early 80s. Pretty much every time there's a major cast change, that's a different part of the book. Um, so as I was saying, the most interesting part is the brief period of time in the early 80s when creator and showrunner Laura Michaels was not part of Saturday Night Live, but Eddie Murphy was. Very fascinating, especially since um, so many people think of that show as Laura Michaels' baby. I think a lot of people forget that there actually was a period where he was not involved and had left the show. And again, since that was sort of what um, sparked Eddie Murphy's um, career, um, who a lot of people think of, myself included, as one of, if not its most, uh, SNL's most famous alum. Um, 
I also forgot there are certain Hollywood folks who are cast members, either well after their careers were established. Billy Crystal actually was already pretty well established. He'd already been on soap and had been a known stand-up when he was on the show in the 80s. Um, and then Michael McKeon, who actually didn't join, join the show until the 90s. And at that point, I mean, he Vernon Shirley was already come and gone. Um, he had already done uh, This is Spinal Tap. Um, and then some people whose careers start out that you may forget, like Julia Louis-Dreyfus, for example, was again a cast member during um, that period of time in the 80s that I referenced, um, you know, before uh, Seinfeld was on anyone's mind or anyone knew who Jerry Seinfeld was. Um, and speaking of Eddie Murphy, as I referenced earlier, he is actually one of the few living in 2002, that is cast members who did not participate in this book. So sadly, there are no quotes from him, which is too bad, because I think it would have been very interesting. I, I know since this book has been published, he has sort of um, made more peace, if you will, um, with Saturday Night Live. He did appear on its 40th anniversary, I believe the first time he came back. And then he also hosted um, pretty recently, sometime in the last couple of years. But until then, he really did not, um, he, his relationship with the show was not a, a, a great one, I guess, from what I understand. But, um, but he was so wonderful on the show, and I would have loved to have heard what he said about it, but also respect the fact he didn't want to talk. Um, there are a few participants um, who are in this book whose reputations may have soured somewhat. Um, for a variety of reasons, the publication of this book. So some of those interviews could be hard to stomach. I won't get into it too much now. Um, either way, if you are a fan of Saturday Night Live, especially from the beginning, and especially um, if you sort of liked their coverage of the 2000 presidential election uh, recount, if you recall, that got some great skits with um, Will Farrell as George W. Bush and Daryl Hammond as Al Gore. My absolute favorite one, if you can find it, it's very hard to find for some reason, um, is where they're playing the odd couple. They decide to be co-presidents with Al Gore as Felix and Will Farrell as Oscar is, I think, one of the funniest skits from by far ever on that show. Um, this book does cover a lot of it since it was actually at this point was recent history. Um, so you'll be entertained. And again, a quick read, despite the fact it is a physically long book. And that is all I have for my books. And I believe Liz is ready to go. That is correct. All right. Hello, everybody. I hope you are all having a great day. Let me share my screen. So I only have two books uh, to talk about today, um, but I really enjoy both of them. So my first book is, sorry, I'm like getting all these little screen buttons out of the way, uh, Road of Bones by Christopher Golden. Now I am a little bit biased towards the works of Christopher Golden because he is a friend of mine um, and he is lovely in person uh, and a wonderful writer. So uh, the R, 504 Koloma, Koloma Highway um, is a road through the Russian Far East. We're talking like Yakutsk, like way over on the Pacific side of, of uh, Russia. This remote freezing 1200 mile stretch is also known as the Road of Bones, which is like so metal, um, because it was built with labor, labor from Soviet gulags and many many, many of the hundreds of thousands of prisoners who worked on constructing this highway also happened to be buried beneath it because they died from exhaustion, malnutrition, illness, all sorts of things in the environment um, while it was being constructed. It's actually, it's very sad and, and a piece of Russian history that I was unfamiliar with. So this book is set on this, this scary road, um, which is real and very isolated. Okay. So documentary producer Felix Teagland, AKA Teague, and his filming companion, Pete, who he also happens to owe a lot of money to, um, are driving the infamous Road of Bones to get spec footage for a new documentary series. Teague is kind of on the outs with producing um, and whatnot. So he's really hoping that this is gonna be his like big big success and he'll be able to pay off all these debts that he owes. And Pete hopes it's a success too, because he is one of the people that he owes money to. Um, so what starts out as a freezing cold research trip, because remember this is so far north that in winter there's almost no daylight. It's like, it's very far north. Um, what starts out as a freezing cold research trip turns into a fast paced fight for your life situation that pits Teague, 
Pete, some companions they picked up along the way, including a very creepy child, which is like never a good sign. If you just happen to come across a creepy child that needs help, like just don't. I mean, do, do help children, but like if you're the protagonist in a horror novel, like just don't. Um, they have to take these companions they've picked up along the way against supernatural spirits of the forest and sub-zero Siberian temperatures where legit, if you're outside for 10 minutes, like you will freeze to death. Like it's just so inhospitable. Um, this was a fun fast read that I would recommend to anyone who likes horror. Um, it had some good folk horror elements to it. Uh, and I also just really, I feel like I, um, you know, Russia is in the news a lot right now, not for the best reasons. That was not one of the reasons I chose this book. Um, but when you think of Russia, you tend to think of Moscow, St. Petersburg, the sort of Western side of Russia, um, when it does extend all the way over to the Pacific coast. And it was interesting to read a book set in that part of Russia that you know we in the United States don't hear about that much. Okay, and my next book is Hima Wadi House by Harmony Becker. It's funny that Louise's, uh, one of Louise's books uh, had a main character named Nao because this book also has the main character is Nao. Um, I studied abroad in Japan for a year and it was lovely. Um, and so reading this book really brought me back to being a sort of a newcomer in Japan, even though Nao isn't really a newcomer, but let's get into it. So Nao was born in Japan to her Japanese mother and her white American father. As a small child, her whole family moved permanently to the United States. And when she moved to the United States as a child, now basically pushed back her Japanese identity and just be tried to be as American as possible. You know, she wanted to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. She wanted to play soccer. She didn't want to speak in Japanese. Um, and she just really distanced herself from that aspect of her heritage. She forgot how to speak Japanese, like a lot. So at 19, she returns to Japan to reconnect with her Japanese heritage uh, and study Japanese language. She moves into Himawari House, which is a shared co-op style building with other international students. Um, one is from Korea and one is from Singapore. And then also two Japanese brothers live there. So she quickly bonds with most of her housemates and reconnects with her Japanese heritage um, so she does have struggles that she goes into about being a biracial uh, woman who doesn't feel fully American, but doesn't feel fully Japanese. And it goes into how some people in Japan treat her as, as uh, the words gaijin, uh, which means foreigner. And it's not the nicest word for foreigner, unfortunately. And she's like, well, I'm Japanese. I was born here. My mom's Japanese. And they're like, yeah, but you were raised in America. You don't speak fluent Japanese. Like, you're not really Japanese, like you're Japanese, but you're not really Japanese. That's what the, some people in this book sort of say to her. Um, one thing I really, really enjoyed about this book is the bilingual writing style. So it's a graphic novel, which I don't think I mentioned, but I showed it right off the bat. And in the text bubbles, um, it'll have, I'm using this, my hand is a piece of paper. The top of the text bubble will ha have in Japanese what's being said by the Japanese speaking character. And then underneath has just the English bits that now understands. So you get a feeling of what she's experiencing with that language barrier. And I also personally really liked it because it gave me an excuse to practice reading Japanese, which is something that I have been horribly out of practice uh, with doing since I came back to the United States from Japan 15 years ago. Oh God, time flies. Um, so, I, I really enjoyed this book. I'm not quite done with it. I've been, it's been a little hectic, but it is beautifully drawn and written by Harmony Becker. She also illustrated They Called Us Enemy, which is George Takei's um, graphic novel. Um, it's very heartfelt and it, it just really brought me back to when I, even though I'm not Japanese, obviously, um, was just in Japan and experiencing the culture for the first time. So Really loved it, really excited to finish it. Definitely recommend it to anyone who um, is interested in Japan or anything uh, related to that subject. And those are my only two. So I'm gonna stop my screen share and uh, turn it over to Laura. Thank you so much, everyone. Greg, I know you have to go on the desk in two minutes. Do you quickly have any TV shows you wanna share with us? 
I do actually. Um, and uh, thank you. Um, before I go um, and leave all you fine people, um, there has been a show I've been watching on um, HBO Max recently called Our, Flags mean, Our Flag uh, Means Death. And it is, uh, the, and it's made by the creator of The Hunt for the Wilder People, What We Do in the Shadows, um, and Jojo Rabbit, so Taika Waititi. Um, so if you know anything about um, his uh, types of shows, you also know that it tends to deal with what would normally be rather very serious um, situations and adds like a bunch of absurdist humor about it. And uh, this is no different. It takes place in the early 18th century uh, during the golden age of piracy um, and focuses on this wealthy uh, aristocratic man by the name of Bonnet, who I just found out was actually a real person, though this is loosely based off of his life. And Bonnet is like part of the British aristocracy. He's has a pretty comfortable life, but he's going through like a bit of a midlife crisis. Um, and he decides that his midlife crisis, rather than buying like the, what would have been the equivalent of a car or something that day, uh, was to become a, uh, a pirate uh, captain and sail his own ship and have his own crew. But he's going to uh, be a different pirate captain because while other people kill you with murder and all that horrible stuff, he's going to kill you with kindness. That's his words. He has a pirate ship. He pays everybody a salary uh, rather than just having people loot uh, folks. He has recreational places like a library, even though like only one other member of the ship can actually read. Um, and he really values your opinions. So if you have like a problem or you have a suggestion, he will seriously try to make it happen. This is all wonderful stuff coming that would be coming from a 21st century boss. But again, he's not a 21st century boss. He's an early 18th century boss with a crew of murderous pirates. So they all kind of view it as weakness, event, um, like basically. And he's like one bad day away from a mutiny. Um, that all changes, however, when he encounters a um, an old uh, acquaintance who is kind of a uh, like a schoolyard bully of his back in the old days. And uh, he accidentally kills him, um, but everybody else thinks he murdered him. And so all of a sudden he gets like really like, he gets like a great deal of respect and he's like, oh, cool, I can do this. But also now I'm really wanted as a, you know, as a murderous pirate. And I, in that doorway that he could have easily gotten to his old life has kind of been closed. And to make matters uh, even more complicated, he gets the attention of Blackbeard himself, who is also played by Taiko Watiti. Um, and may I say, he does a really good job as Blackbeard. I did not think that would be the role that Taika would play, but oh my God, he is, he's just, it's really great. Um, I can't, I have to say this is a lot of fun. Um, it is just kind of weird and absurdist and silly. Um, you've got um, like a lot of performances that are stand out that I don't want to spoil. Um, but if you, if you like, if, if you like pirate shows and you like that type of comedy and you can deal with a little violence. Um, I would say go for, go for this. Like I would say this is kind of like a light R rating. Granted, only three episodes have been out, so this could change. But I really enjoyed it, um, and uh, I'd give it a watch. And on that note, uh, I have to depart. So thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Greg. Good luck at the desk. Um, all right. Anyone else want to share something? I have I have one, but I want to make sure someone else gets to it. I have one thing I can talk about uh, that I could wait you if you want to go first, Laura, that's fine. Um, so I, uh, with, along with many other people uh, in the country, saw the Batman over the weekend, um, the new Batman movie with Robert Pattinson and um, uh, uh, Zoe Kravitz, uh, among other people. And I enjoyed it. It was three hours long, which I'm going to be honest with you, more than 115 minutes more than 105 minutes and I'm done. Like I have, I have a life to get back to. I have cats to play with. I've got a crossword puzzle to finish. Like I can't waste my time in the movies, but um, I did enjoy it. It was more like a noir film, I think, rather than your sort of like um, the other film offerings from the DC cinematic universe. Um, uh, and sort of the, the two main non-spoilery things that I'm going to say about it are, 
it rains so much in Gotham. Like I came out of the theater and I just felt damp because it is constantly raining. The theater was dry as a bone, but I was just like, oh, I'm so like just waterlogged. Um, and the other thing is I love seeing someone play Batman as a hyper-focused, zero charisma having person. Like if Batman is very, in a lot of other things, it's like, yeah, I'm like a playboy and I, my parents died. And in this one, it's just like, I am vengeance. I have to save the city. I don't have a sense of humor. I have no charisma. No one, I'm, I don't want to go on dates with anyone. I'm Batman. And I just really like that. So good job, our pats. I have to ask, do, you, do we have to watch the poor uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wayne get shot again, like with every bet? I, if memory serves, uh, that they do not actually show that. There's no oh, like real good. origin story. Like you learn about, it. it's mentioned, but it's not like, and here they are coming out of seeing Zorro and pew, 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 you know. I don't think I, that is brought up. That makes me want to see it maybe because I feel like I have seen that poor couple get murdered so many times in Gotham, in Tim Burton's Batman, in Batman v Superman. I feel like I'm leaving one out, but uh, oh no, Batman Begins, of course, I forget that one. So, and there's probably more. I don't think they showed the Adam West show. That might be the one because I, I don't think it would have fit in with the tone of that show but my god this poor couple every time they go to the theater <laughs> it's like yeah. enough tone wise this is like the opposite end of the spectrum from the adam west batman tv show there is nothing fun about it like it is just bleak and sad and no one is well everyone in this movie has so much emotional trauma in their lives it's like not funny but it's very well done there's a YouTube content creator I really like. Um, they refer to themselves as Council of Geeks um, and do a lot of um, some vi reviews, video essays, a lot of um, various things on their their channel. And uh, the latest is about before this movie came out. Um, there is now a review of the Batman. Um, and it's funny every time they talk, they always just say the Batman when talking about this movie, which makes me laugh. But basically, about sort of the origin, the history of the concept of dark Batman. Um, in the set dark in the um, tone as a tone and it's very interesting I definitely um, I can send you the link Liz I think you might be interested in that maybe I'll put in the description here as well because um, it I I'm I'm fascinated by this movie I have very mixed feelings about the uh, DC uh, cinematic universe such as it is uh, I still have not seen the Snyder cut of Justice League and I just Talk about having a life. I just four hours. You don't have and, to. You yeah. can skip it. I feel like you and Greg saw it for me, and that that was very helpful. So I just live vicariously through your reviews, um, and I don't want to rewatch the Joss Whedon cut because, well, Joss Whedon personally. So uh, yes. So I'm not sure how I make of it. Um, Lois V. Lois. Lois V. Superman. Lois and Superman on the CW. I am loving that, but that is not part of the DC cinematic universe. Um, uh, highly recommend that show for DC fans. Uh, but maybe I'll check this one out. Again, if I don't have to see the Waynes get killed, that actually gives it a, that's a plus in my opinion. Uh, please, do you have anything before I go? No, okay. So my, I'm gonna talk about the Gilded Age. Has anyone here, either of you seen that uh, HBO show? Um, so it's an HBO show, it takes place during, well, the Gilded Age, um, so late, mid late 19th century New York basically has old money versus new money. Um, it, um, it is, it is the showrunner and is created by Julian Fellows who people may recognize that name from Downton Abbey. Um, he also wrote Gosford Park. I loved Gosford Park. I'm not hot take. I'm not a huge Downton Abbey fan. I feel like it's a little blasphemous to say that I never can get into that show. Um, I had loved upstairs downstairs, which Downton Abbey was sort of take off on that. Um, Downton Abbey basically I was, I was upstairs downstairs with better production value and I still see that. Worse scripts, better cinematography is how I like to describe Downton Abbey. Please feel free to add me in the comments. Um, but so in this show, I and like Downton Abbey, which I really want to like, I really want to like this show. This has, it's filmed in New York and has pretty much every single person who's been in a on the stage in the last 20 years is in it. 
Uh, Christine Baranski and Cynthia Nixon are the headliners. Um, Carrie Coon is in it, who um, I think is a really good actress, despite the fact she was in the most recent Ghostbusters movie. And watchers of the show will know how I feel about felt about that movie. But she she is a very good actress, and she actually was also very good at Ghostbusters. It wasn't her fault that the script was terrible. Um, and she um, she I understand she was in a version of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Um, the um, who else was in it? Uh, uh, Audra McDonald is in it, Kelly O'Hara is in it, Katie Finneran is in it, um, Danae Benton, who is in, um, basically made her, got her name from, um, oh gosh, the, oh god, the musical based on um, War and Peace, uh, The Great Comet, thank you, uh, and just a lot of the um, Celia Keenan Boulder, I mean, I literally could go on and on, and I, I love Broadway, I love musical theater, I knew a lot of these people, even though I have seen almost none of them live, and it's, I don't, I don't know, it, it, it's fine. Oh, Nathan Lane is in it too. It, it's fine, it's fine. I, I Not horrible, I'm still watching it, but I don't find any of the characters super compelling. Everyone has one character trope. Cynthia Nixon and Christine Bransky, who are sisters. Um, Cynthia Nixon plays a character who is very sweet. That is her character trait, she is very sweet. Uh, Christine Bransky is, she has a little bit more nuance, I guess, but so she's just kind of me. Carrie Coon plays a character who's ambitious. Um, uh, Cynthia Nixon, I don't even remember the characters' names, I'm going by their actors. Cynthia Nixon and Christine Baranski's niece, played by Louisa Jacobson, um, who's the daughter of Mel Street, by the way. Um, she plays Marion. She's nice. <laughs> so she's, we got this family with the, the sweet aunt, the mean aunt, and the nice niece. <laughs> And that's it. I couldn't tell you anything more about them. Um, I will say the acting does save it a lot. Um, I really like both Nixon and Baranski as actresses, act, as actors, and they're both very good. Um, you know, Cynthia Nixon probably is best known as Miranda from Sex and the City and its revival. And just like that, which I did watch, but I'm not talking about, there's been way too much discourse about it. I don't want to talk about it anymore, but, um, she, you know, she's a very good actress. She's very different than Miranda here, and you don't even recognize her in terms, you know, so it's just, and same with Christine Baranski. I, so they, and again, Carrie Coon is wonderful. The acting is great. So, so uh, I'll be curious other people's thoughts. It is sort of a hot show, especially because of Downton Abbey, the hole that Downton Abbey left. Although I understand there is a movie, another movie coming out, which, yay. <laughs> so that's what I've seen. Um, I've not seen anything theatrically recently. Um, I am looking forward to seeing West Side Story is now streaming and you can actually watch it um, on, if you get one of our Disney Plus Roku's, you can watch it there. Um, so I'm excited to rewatch the new West Side Story because I very much loved it when I saw it in the theater. Um, one thing I just want to add before we close out here is, which I forgot to say at the top of the show is again thank you so much to our friends of the Waltham Public Library they're always so supportive and so supportive of these programs especially our um, virtual programming that we've done the last two years and so thank you friends and I'm sorry I didn't mention you at the beginning so uh, thank you to Louise and Liz and also to Greg who is covering a desk right now and we will see you next month so thank you and goodbye